Father. Today I only hear your voice. In the deepest silence, I come to hear your voice. And to receive your word, I have no prayer but this. I come to ask you for the truth. That's the way start the morning out. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Netta. And welcome. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, what a great opportunity we have to come together. And as the song said, I only want to hear your voice. You know, getting in touch with that inner voice is so important. And in working with the, the book, A Course in Miracles, that is something that is advocated. There are many, many wonderful pathways to God, and we all 
are aware of, of them and we are aware of the importance of silence. We are aware of the importance of practice or ritual, even though ritual is not meant to be permanent, it's just designed to fall away, but we can't overlook the helpfulness of ritual. And also this idea of prayer, which is part of many traditions, prayer, we're not talking just the prayer of words, but we're talking about the prayer of the heart, the prayer of your desire. Because Jesus tells us that truth will be returned to you, to your awareness, by your desire, as it was lost by your desire for something else. So we can acknowledge the importance of silence, the importance of practice, and the importance of prayer, but we're talking deep prayer, not just ritualistic repetition of words, but the prayer of the heart, what it is that you truly desire, that you truly want in your heart of hearts. That is also very, very important. And when we open up to truth, it's interesting what Jesus has to tell us in A Course in Miracles about truth because the first time I read this line in the Course, I just had kind of the, a big smile on my face with wide eyes and I read the line, the truth is true and only the truth is true. It just seemed like so funny to me because I'm like, okay, he's, he's like, this is important. The truth is true <laughs> and only the truth is true. Echoing what w many of the mystics and sages have said throughout the ages, that truth has no opposite. What does that mean to a mind that believes in opposites? It's like saying the truth is abstract, okay? Can you give me an example <laughs> of abstraction? I get that question a lot where people write to me, what is, an, what is abstract? Can you give me an example of abstraction? And I write back, no. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> there aren't any examples in a world of images, in a world of duality, in a world of multiplicity, you're asking for an example of absolute oneness. <laughs> you're asking for an example of that which has no opposite in a world of opposites. Well, can you give me some words? What's a good synonym, you know? Well, I can tell you that Jesus tells us words are but symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. So no, I cannot give you a word <laughs> either. There is no word. We we can practice with words and, you know, the name of God is my inheritance comes to mind as a workbook lesson where we basically we can take one word like God and let that one word safely replace all the others, the trillions and trillions of others, with a prayer, with a desire that we know the actual presence of love, of, of oneness, of, of God, not as a word, but as an actual experience of identity, of, of identity. Christ is an idea in the mind of God. It's the prayer of our heart is to know that. So, if we're really honest and we take a look, we see that A Course in Miracles is a book that has a lot of words. In fact, the scribe of the Course uh, was said to have exclaimed one time, at last, a pathway back to God for intellectuals. That gives us a little bit of, a, of an idea why there's so many chapters, 31 chapters, 365 lessons, a manual for teachers, and a clarification of terms. But let us not forget that words are but symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. Are words essential to truth? No, there, there actually are no words in the truth. 
the truth is beyond the words. Rudy's checking. I think there's somebody's building something. <laughs> we, we have many opportunities for forgiveness. <laughs> Sights, sounds, smells. It goes on and on and on. So, if words have nothing to do with truth, because truth is absolute oneness, you know, Jesus says in the workbook, we say God is and then we cease to speak, pointing to that absolute stillness of, of truth. What is the role of words then in healing? Because healing is more practical for us. You know, truth is, is the ultimate state of what is. What is the role of words in healing? Jesus tells us, strictly speaking, words play no role in healing. Okay, now we're starting to get things in perspective. Words are not the truth, and words play, strictly speaking, no role in healing. Well, who invented the words? They don't seem really that important. The ego made up words. We should have a clue about that in this world because if you travel around the world, you go to countries, there's many countries and what? Many languages. Right here in Europe, there are many languages. Differences? Oh yeah. Different languages, you know, the Nordic languages and and the Latin and the Greek and we have ancient languages, we have newer languages. Uh, just like in Alaska, they have many different words for snow. <laughs> in Europe, <laughs> there are many different languages. And you need an interpreter. But an interpreter, a good interpreter, will try to convey the meaning beneath the differences of the words and the languages to keep the meaning stable and consistent. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing with this projected world of ego differences and words and images, is the Holy Spirit is the interpreter. And why do we need the Holy Spirit? Because we need to have one meaning for everything. Only a single purpose can stabilize perception. Only a single purpose can endow events and circumstances with, with stable meaning. We will not find lasting stillness without a purpose. And Jesus is telling us that the purpose of the world, the purpose for which the world was made, the purpose for which time and space was made, the purpose for which the cosmos was made was, he calls it, hate. That's underneath the projected world. Hate made the world. Some of you might remember from the Course, fear binds the world, forgiveness sets it free. Hate made the world. Forgiveness sets a sleeping mind free to be itself. So though the world was made by the ego, God doesn't know of past, present, and future. God doesn't know of time. God doesn't understand linear time. God doesn't understand separation. God doesn't understand fragmentation. Strictly speaking, of course, God doesn't understand words. Remember we've been told God knows the prayer of your heart before a word is uttered. The language of, of God and understanding is one of stillness. Be still and know that I am God. And the approach to God is through healing. And healing is unified perception. Now uh, you may notice that the language in A Course in Miracles is a little bit different than Advaita Vedanta, a little bit different than popular teachers like Muji or Eckhart or Adyashanti use. Teachers use different languages, but, but we can talk across all these different languages about unified awareness. You can call it 
unified awareness, you can call it forgiveness. If you're a scientist, you can call it the quantum field. It goes by different names, but it's a state of unified awareness. And the only way of approaching truth is this sense of unified awareness. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus says that ideas leave not their source. So just like Christ is an idea in the mind of God, and Christ has never left the source, Christ has never left the Creator, Christ is in heaven, God is in heaven, and heaven is a state of mind, a perfect oneness. It's, it's not a place. There's no where. Where is it? It's, there is no question about where. It's all that there is. It's a, it's a state of mind without opposite. The kingdom of heaven has no opposite. But in approaching that, we have to come to the state of presence. We have to come to the state of unified awareness. We have to come to a state of mind that is so unified that it knows not of judgment. That's what unified awareness is. That's what the forgiven world is. It's, it knows not of judgment. Oftentimes I hear people saying, you know, I've got this really bad habit, it's called judgment, and I know I could be happy if I could just stop judging. Isn't that pretty common? Stop judging. The Course is telling me to stop judging. Actually, the Course isn't telling you to stop judging. If you read in the Manual for Teachers, it's saying that actually judgment is impossible. You see the difference between trying to stop something that's really there <laughs> and coming to an awareness that it never was possible in the first place? And doesn't that make intuitive sense that God, why would God create a being, an ex extension of God, that could judge? That's ridiculous. What, what, why would oneness decide, oh, I think I'm going to get a little judgment going here, a little spice. There's no need for spice in oneness. <laughs> Love doesn't need to spice things up. <laughs> it's, it's, Glorious enough without the spicing things up with judgment. Now judgment is not something that you need to stop. It's something that you need to experience as utterly and completely and absolutely impossible. And I'm not talking about a future event. I'm saying it simply has no existence. And yet if you believe in it, the Holy Spirit has a way to reach the mind that even believes that judgment is possible. And isn't that wonderful? I mean, if you were looking for an escape hatch from the world of time and space, you would want to go into that escape hatch or that portal that would take you into the place of, wow, everything just is so wonderful. Let all things be exactly as they are. All things work together for good. There are no exceptions. What a spectacular, spectacular state of mind. So, here's how that is accomplished in the sense of Jesus tells us um, this is a journey without distance to a goal that has never changed. Okay. Uh, prepare ye now for the undoing of what never was. Don't you love the way that he's talking? I mean, he's talking in there like, lighten up a little bit. This isn't as serious as you're making it out to be because you're just simply going to be undoing what never was in the first place, which is judgment. It never was. The undoing of what never was. And yet, he starts his sentence off with, prepare ye now. Okay, we have to take this at face value that if I believe I'm asleep and dreaming and I'm caught in a mind of filled with judgments, that maybe in that mind there will be some preparation necessary. 
maybe I need preparation, seeming preparation, to go into that state of unified awareness and then beyond that to experience the truth. Krishnamurti, mm, wow, what a, what a being. Krishnamurti said, truth is a pathless land. He was saying the same thing that Jesus was saying. Truth is true and only truth is true. So don't get into comparing and judging and criticizing pathways. Even Helen Shuckman, the scribe of A Course in Miracles, after she had scribed the Course, she started to get in kind of these motherly feelings, you know, like in this world, mothers in, in different species want to protect their young. She started feeling a little protective of this book that she spent seven years with great difficulty <laughs> channeling. She was a bit protective about the Course. And as after time went on after the Course came, she was a bit concerned about people are misusing the Course, people are taking words out of, passages out of context. And Jesus simply said to her, take not another's, another's pathway as your own, neither should you judge it. Like, I have given you this Course as an answer to a prayer. And actually the first words that were coming from Jesus to Helen Shuckman, which he repeated over and over at the very beginning, was, this is a Course in Miracles, please take notes. And then he'd come back a little bit later, this is a Course in Miracles, please take notes. He kept repeating that one line because what? She wasn't taking notes. She, was, she wasn't following the instructions. It was the Lord of Life speaking to her, and she was like, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I've got lots of things to do today. And Jesus patiently, this is a course in miracles. Please take notes. You see how loving. Just repeat the instruction. And then finally she, she runs to Bill, you know, her boss at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, and she's like, it's, it's just... It, there's a, there's a voice, and it, it won't go away, and it, it keeps repeating itself. It's, it's insistent. And he said, well, maybe you should uh, write down. <laughs> Bill, there's your collaborator. We need collaboration. Maybe you should just write it down. We'll write it down. We'll look at it in the morning. If it's complete gibberish, if it's crazy, we'll just crumple the paper up, we'll throw it in the waste can. Bill, the comforter, just, just allow it. Just allow it to say whatever it has to say. These are research psychologists, so they, you know, psychologists, psychiatrists tend to lock people up <laughs> that hear inner voices, so that you can see there's some apprehension going on here. And they don't know what's going on, they just pray, they ask for another way, and the other way it was being given to them, and then Bill was just saying, just let it, you know, we, we did ask for a better way, another way to live, so let's just give it a chance, and, and we'll throw it away if it, if it doesn't make any sense. And then came, this is A Course in Miracles, it is a required course, the very famous introduction came through, and they both took a, like in, in that is a, Voice liberation. Ah, it took a ah, a, a sigh. The original ah of a course in miracles was let it come, just let it enter, let it enter. And I would say that that's really why we're all here, because underneath all of us gathering together is there's a prayer. We we have a prayer for peace, peace of mind. We have a prayer for healing. We have a prayer for happiness, for joy, for laughter. We have a very deep prayer to, to know the fruits of the kingdom and ultimately to know ourself as we were created by God. The only anxiety, the only worry, the only concern that ever enters our mind is when we forget one simple thing. I am as God created me. Just from the belief that I can create myself, all difficulty seems to arise. From the belief that I can be my own source, that I can be the creator of myself, that I can invent myself and I can reinvent myself 
and I can make myself, as the ego might say, any damn way I want to be, that belief that I can make myself, I will assure you, is behind any worry, concern, fear, guilt, pain, suffering. It's just one thing. So, I want you, as you come to this experience this week, I want you to come back and relax into, I did not create myself. You can let your shoulders, ah, oh, I didn't create myself, that's right. I really don't have anything to worry about. I really don't have anything to be really concerned about because, thank heavens, I did not create myself. That's why I'm here. I'm here because of that and because I felt it so strong in my heart that I have always felt for these 33 years with the Course and Jesus guiding me that that, like he told the apostles, go where you are welcomed. And, and I feel here in this barn, with all of you <laughs> here in the Netherlands, I feel the welcome. I feel I have been called here to speak these words that the Holy Spirit wants to put on my heart and share. That's why I'm here. I've been called. I've been invited. I gladly accept. I accept with joy this great welcome. Also, I think why we're coming here is we're coming here to teach the kingdom to the kingdom. You know, always they say, yeah, yeah go on, go on, you're just preaching to the choir. Well, Jesus says, teach the kingdom to the kingdom. We're here to share the love and joy and happiness and laughter in our heart with each other, which is really with ourself. We're here to strengthen our awareness, come closer in awareness to the kingdom of heaven. That's no small thing. That's, that's huge. I used to think when I was in university and I went to all these uh, in-services and I would go to conferences and so forth, I would think I was going to get something. I would go, I would take notes, I would listen to the speaker. I would think I am here to receive something from the speaker, but I didn't realize that I was there to give, as we're always wherever we seem to be, to give, to extend. And giving and receiving are the same, so we are blessed in that giving. When we're kind, when we're open-hearted, when we're smiling and laughing, we're extending, but also we're extending to ourself. Teaching is not in words alone. Teaching is our attitude. In fact, if the attitude doesn't match the words, you know how children can spot that right away. Mommy says she's happy, but she doesn't look happy. You know, they can spot a contradiction easily between the attitude and the words. And we also have to be that quick. We, we can't be like that game, the emperor has no clothes on, where you go around pleasing and pretending and don't say that. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Instead of telling people you shouldn't judge, why not just realize for ourselves in our mind that judgment is impossible? Doesn't that seem more practical than going around saying to people and pointing the finger, you shouldn't judge? What does that even mean? You know, what, how is that helpful? It's like we just want to come to that state of mind where we have that loving acceptance and it extends and radiates towards everyone that we see. So I happily accepted the invitation to come here. I have to say, as I said last night too, with, with uh, Kos and, and Doris and the great tradition of teaching A Course in Miracles here uh, with those teachers and the devotion of those teachers, that devotion is important in the sense that devotion is a witness and it's important for us, as we're taking our baby steps, to have witnesses of devotion. It happened in the parable of David. I came across A Course in Miracles at a humanistic psychology conference that Carl Rogers was the speaker at in La Jolla, California, Southern California. And um, right away, when the book was in my hands, I was also given 
a book called Forgiveness in Jesus by Ken Wapnick and a book called Nothing Real Can Be Threatened by Tara Singh. So I got three books at once, A Course and Forgiveness in Jesus and Nothing Real Can Be Threatened. Very shortly after I received the book, I was guided to go to Los Angeles by two students of Tara Singh and then I went there to the house where they lived and they were all living there in purpose and devotion, very devoted lives, as I also, Tara Singh, was living a very devoted life. He was an Indian teacher, a Sikh, who was teaching and practicing the Course in Miracles back in 1986. That was important for me to go there. That was important for me to walk through the door and go into the house and feel this expansive feeling in my heart and then to look around and sayings from the Course on the wall. A picture of Gandhi, a picture of Mother Teresa. They're saints and mystics, you know. It was a very important kind of, almost like a premonition of this will be your life. Just by walking into this house on South Burnside Avenue in Los Angeles, it was like a, a powerful witness, like here's a premonition, this is going to be your life too, a life of devotion to spirit. And then, a few years later, I, I went and uh, I went to a gathering by Tara Singh in uh, Monroe, Michigan, and I remember he got to the chair in, in front of the, all the audience, but he got there, I think he got there maybe an hour, an hour and a half before the audience showed up, and he was in stillness and meditation sitting by himself on the stage. And Jesus guided me to go in there and sit in one of the chairs and go into a deep meditation with Tara Singh. And it was so funny, when the people started to file in, I was in such a deep meditation that they were like energy patterns in my mind. It was like the Matrix. Zoop, zoop, all these energy patterns whooshing behind me, whooshing around me. And, and it was important for me to go and meet Tara Singh. It was important for me the next year to go up and spend a lot of time with Ken and Gloria Wapnick and their foundation for the awakening mind up there in the Catskill Mountains. And it was important for me the first trip I took, then five years after the course came to my life, Jesus took me on a trip, a five and a half week trip around the United States and meeting Robert Perry, meeting Beverly Hutchinson, going up to Community Miracles Center, back then it was called California Miracle Center, and going around, meeting my friend Dorothy, who was in a very high state of mind, very happy, joyful woman, going around, and that was important too, because it was like Jesus saying, enjoy the ride, this, this is going to be the tour where you're going to meet people on this trip who have dedicated their whole lives to practicing and living A Course in Miracles. That was helpful. And I think with, with Coase and Doris and the, and the work that they've done with Mick, Miracles in Contact, and the organization here in Holland, you have a tradition, you have a devotion to the Course in Miracles as a pathway and, and living this, really taking it on to live it. And I applaud you for that. I, am, I offer my gratitude for that. In the whole context of Europe, where we've had world wars, we've had the Spanish Inquisition, we've had the Crusades, Muslims killed in the name of Jesus, you're here in Holland and you're embracing A Course in Miracles and it's not even popular to embrace something by Jesus in Europe, and you're doing it anyway. I think that's fantastic. I know Netta, we talked a lot, when she first started to receive the songs and everything, it was like, whoa, this is, <laughs> this is going against my upbringing a little bit. You were speaking for all of Europe, yes, yes. The, the ego has misused the Christian symbols, has misused the word God, has misused the word Jesus Christ, has misused the words Holy Spirit. It's been so misused that it's not surprising that Europeans, with some of these words, have a bad taste in their mouth. They're sour to these words. 
history has not been kind. The ego's use of these words has, has not been kind, has not really been pointing to love. It's been pointing to control and war and manipulation and secrecy and privacy. These are not qualities of God. God has nothing to do with any of those things. So when I come here to Europe and, and I and I go and teach in gatherings, I won't even, in some cases, I didn't even use those words. I, I would talk more in Advaita terms. I would talk more in psychological terms. I would use movies. I even had a, a movie that uh, Jason and I were going to show in in Ireland and Northern Ireland, and the Holy Spirit had us edit the movie for an Irish version and a Northern Irish version of the movie because the symbols had been so misused <laughs> in Ireland <laughs> that the Spirit was like, here, this is you'll need this one in Ireland, you'll need this one in Northern Ireland. The Spirit loves us so much that will tailor the message to reach our hearts in whatever it takes because there's no specialness to any words you know truth is way beyond the words and as I said before strictly speaking words are not necessary for healing healing is more associated with prayer and prayer is the medium of miracles and prayer transcends all cultures all all concepts. Prayer is like your altar in your mind and you want to cultivate that altar. You want to keep that altar clean and pure and clear to maintain your connection with God. So I have had fun. I have had so much fun coming to Europe and, and here in Holland three years ago that was amazing and then it seems like though every time I come to Europe there's something big happening. Like, it's, it's a lot of drama. Like, I mean, I come here and everyone's all excited and everyone's glued to the TV set. And I said, what's going on? It's the Euro Cup. I said, ooh, okay, tell me. Euro Cup. He said, we'll get back to that in a bit. We get, we're all watching the Euro Cup. I said, okay. All the countries, Euro Cup. Every country, Euro Cup, Euro Cup, Euro Cup, Euro Cup. Sounds important. Okay. Then I come back another time, they're like, it's important, they're electing a new pope. We're waiting for the smoke to come out of the steeple. <laughs> and then finally when they do, oh, we've elected an Argentinian, it's Francis, Pope Francis, you know. Just when I come, Pope Francis gets elected. Okay. Then I was coming over one time, they said, scientists in Bern, Switzerland, where the particle accelerators have discovered the God particle. Right when I'm coming, right before I get here. <laughs> in Europe, they're all excited. We've discovered the God particle. And the, the reason they named it the God particle, it's interesting whenever scientists use that word on, and particle together, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Because scientists don't believe in God, but now they're calling this the God particle. Okay, but it's the particle that's found everywhere in the universe. So I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. That's a good name, God particle. And now it's Brexit. Now I hear that October 31st, here I'm coming in October, and October 31st is Brexit deadline. I know there's been other deadlines, but still, you know. <laughs> the Europeans say, just stick around, David. <laughs> The deadline might get pushed and pushed and pushed. It's, it's the kick in the can down the road, down the road. But what I'm talking about is forgiveness, which is like going into a state of mind that simply sees the false as false. It doesn't have to figure out the false. It doesn't have to make a commentary on the false. It doesn't even have to solve the false. It just, forgiveness simply sees the false as false. And that's why I think the razor-sharp metaphysics of A Course in Miracles are important. Because why? Because Jesus said, God did not create the world. God did not create time. God did not create the body. These are important teachings, metaphysically, if you're going to see the false as false. It's helpful 
to have someone who's transcended the false to point out what the false are. Because there's no person that can discern the false as false. But the Holy Spirit, who is a creation of God but has this ability to overlook the error, not only it, does he have a function, but it's a very important function for the sleeping mind because that's why we pray and we follow the instructions of the Holy Spirit. We ask to see with Christ's vision. We ask to merge with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is that unifi unified awareness, that purpose I'm talking about, that, that stillness, that unified mind that, that does not judge because it cannot judge. And the Holy Spirit has the function of using what the ego made. So before I was saying the ego made the words, you know, they're symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. The ego made up the words, but the Holy Spirit can use what the ego made. So that means the Holy Spirit can use the words to unwind the mind from believing in the words and believing in the the fragmentation. That's what guidance is. What's the difference between A Course in Miracles and Advaita Vedanta? Advaita Vedanta is a beautiful, beautiful, non-dualistic spiritual pathway to God. Ramana Maharshi, Nizagadatta, Muji, Gangaji. It's a beautiful, beautiful pathway and it involves discipline, it involves opening to this state of mind and I would say oftentimes too silence. If you go to Sahaja, I, I met uh, Muji, we spent some time together last November up in the mountains in southern Portugal but and it was very reverent and very still and very devotional and there was much joy and much laughter and many smiles and I would say that that Advaita basically is a pathway that is a, is a very good pathway back to God. But Advaita doesn't really emphasize guidance. You're not hearing a lot of the Vedans talking about guidance. Now you've been given a Course in Miracles and the Course does emphasize guidance. In fact, Jesus is saying that there are other things that have served others well for years. Meditation, contemplation, fighting against sin. He rattles them off in the I need to do nothing section and he says your way will be different. A holy relationship is given you as a means of saving time. And he even calls some of the traditional methods tedious and time consuming. So we're students, we're followers of Jesus, we're following a court, we're following his pathway and he's saying this will save you time, this will save thousands of years for, for you and for everyone and he's giving us the means of holy relationship. And also he's giving us the means of guidance. The difference between spending 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day in, in meditation and following a pathway of guidance is that his workbook is designed basically to be used in almost any conceivable environment and situation that you can think of and it's a means of converting the way that you look at the world allowing the Holy Spirit to use the images to take you to that unified awareness. You see th there's a methodology to A Course in Miracles that does involve guidance. What is guidance but the Holy Spirit's use of what the ego made? What did the ego make? The ego made the words and the ego made the judgments. You know that thing that we're really impossible, incapable of doing? The ego invented judgment. Now you may say, why did the ego invent judgment in the first place? Well, Jesus describes that when the mind seemed to fall from grace, to believe the impossible, to believe in separation, that the mind went from a natural state of unified joy and love and harmony into a very chaotic state of mind. To go from perfect oneness into something else that 
is just fiction, is just illusion, that's a drop off from bliss to chaos. And the ego, to protect itself, invented judgment as a way of bringing order into chaos. Just like if you had preschoolers that were having a food fight and you got in there <laughs> into the preschool room and you said, okay, stop. All you little girls over there, all you little boys over there, they got cream and stuff hanging all over. Now, we're going to clean up, help each other clean up. And no, no, stop, no more throwing food. You know, you see the preschool teacher comes in and starts arranging and organizing, dividing the group up, no rules, no more throwing food and everything, to try to what? Bring order, to restore order <laughs> to the preschool room. And that's what the ego tried to do with this chaotic state of mind. And so judgment is a way of minimizing the chaos without letting it go. Because why the ego needs you to keep believing in the chaos. The ego doesn't want you to give it up for once and for all, because why? You've given up the ego then. You're back in heaven, which you never left. You're just back into the remembrance, the awareness of truth, if you give up what you never could do in the first place. But all defense mechanisms are for minimizing fear and keeping fear. That's the two things that they do. Minimize fear and keep it. And that's why we have to lay down our, all of our defenses. In the end, you'll find with the Course in Miracles that, that you really do need to be devoted. You know, this, Jesus says in the Course, you will believe this Course entirely, this Course will be believed entirely or not at all. You know, you don't get brownie points, angel points, for 70%, you know, like, oh, yeah, I did, I did, I got involved in miracles, I was really flowing there, but, you know, I had financial problems and health issues, a few other things weighed me down. I had to be practical. I had to work to get that health insurance, and, you know, Jesus is not interested in 70% or 80% or 90% or 99%. This course will be believed entirely or not at all. So that's why... I have such a warm spot in my heart for devotion. When I meet teachers like Coase and Doris and have worked with students for year after year after year, that just warms my heart. That just warms my heart. I feel a, a, a love pouring through because I can recognize devotion. And I, I absolutely see how central this is. Uh, I, Ken Wapnick said many things during his many decades of teaching, but, but toward the end of his life, even Ken started to say, I really see now more than ever that, that this has to be your top priority. Like, this cannot be somewhere on your priority list. You know, feed the family, maintain the body, keep a roof over the children's head, da-da-da, down. And then number seven, Course in Miracles, you know. Oh, no, you got to flip it. Flip it. Don't be a flippity gibbet. Flip it. <laughs> flip it. Put God first. Put healing first. Put awakening first and, and allow everything else to fall away. And it will fade and disappear. I'll guarantee you, as you go for God, everything else will fade away. Why? It's because God is real. <laughs> and who you are, your true essence of Christ is real. And all the illusions will just fall off your mind, just dripping and evaporating away, if you put God first. And Ken really realized that at the end. You know, beyond anything that seemed to be important, Devotion to healing, devotion to forgiveness has to be number one. And that's important. I like that I was shown people as witnesses that had devoted their entire life to A Course in Miracles. That was one of the early trips. Some of the early trips were basically saying, here you go, David. Look at this one. They've devoted their whole life to the Course. Well, that's helpful. I like the vibe of that. I, it gives me hope. Maybe I could do that too. 
you know, it, it helps. That's why people go and visit monasteries sometime, or they go to spend time in convents, because they just want to be around, hang out with those that have dedicated their whole life. You have to admit, in this modern day world, that a lot of monasteries and convents are are closing and closing rapidly. You know, here are people that gave over their entire lives to their calling, to poverty, to chastity, to obedience, and then they grew older and older. And then, I've been in Spain quite a bit, and and I I look at all these monasteries just on the island where I've been staying down there in Mallorca, and they aren't really active monasteries. They're like, they've turned into restaurants, hotels, museums, even this place, you know, you get to feel in some of these corridors, there was probably some deep prayer that was going on here <laughs> at some point, but the ego's need for commercialization, profit, making money and everything, you know, it's like that's the way of the world, you know, it's a, it's a replacement for heaven. What do you expect? There's lots of reciprocity, lots of exchange, lots of money-making going on in the ego system. And yet, what I notice is, I go around and, and they tell me, oh, this used to be, a, here's a chapel, it's not actively used anymore, you can go in there and take pictures, and you can pray in there if you want. But then, there's a gift shop, and, you know, and it, we do have a restaurant, and a little ice cream bar over here, and, oh, and then... You go there and then, oh, we've got a hotel too. You want to, you like the vibe up here? Stay in our hotel room, you know. You have to realize that this is the tendency of the ego. The ego is going to try to make everything into exchange, into reciprocity, into survival of the body. It, it's a different direction from, from deep prayer and devotion. It's, it's the, it's not the same direction. And, but I love how the Course is saying, like, you are the light of the world and you bring the light with you. So, I don't ever avoid any place, you know. I used, I used to, uh, I would love to go to shopping malls and a friend of mine would go with me and we would just go there to just pray and bless everyone and hug people and pour out all of our love from our heart as the light of the world. Meanwhile, my friend's girlfriend, she said, that is the haven of the ego. You must avoid malls at all costs. And I'm like, I'm not interested really in avoiding. I want to love. I'm not interested in being loved, but it's important for me to love. To, to use every situation, every opportunity as an opportunity to share the Beatitudes, to share the love, to bring the joy, to bring the light, to bring the lightness with me wherever I go. On a train ride. I'm coming down here, and I'm in this Volkswagen van coming down here from the airport, from Schiphol Airport, and I'm in the front row. I've got a whole couch to myself with the driver, so I'm like stretched out on the couch, and he's like, you don't have to wear your seatbelt like that, but that's okay, because I've stretched it all the way across to give me lots of room there, and I have a great talk with the guy, and in a while he's talking, talking, talking with me, and then he starts... He just brings up Buddhism. He starts talking about Buddhism. He starts talking about different things. And then he says, oh, and I'm, ca he says, I'm Catholic. I'm like, really? And then we just had the best interaction. It was a holy encounter that lasted two hours coming down here. And he's telling me his whole life story. We're just having a ball in there. But w I'm here to connect. I don't care whether the topic is science, you know, I like science. I like to take it up into quantum physics and talk about the quantum field. Religion? I have nothing against religion. I think religion is peace of mind. And I love having religious discussions and meeting missionaries and people all over the place, ministers on planes and whatever. Atheist? I adore atheists. We have so much fun. I think if they ever have a convention, worldwide convention, Atheists Unite, they should invite me to come. <laughs> because uh, I'm just going to love them up and I just love them. In fact, when I'm talking with them, you know, they're talking about God could never 
do this. And I'm like, right. And God could never do that. I'm like, absolutely. I'm totally with you. And, and God would never have to do with like separating people and this is for God and this is against God. I said, I am absolutely with you. I have a wonderful talk with atheists everywhere I go. It's just like an affinity. Because what does Jesus say through his Course in Miracles, his psychotherapy pamphlet, his Song of Prayer? There's one point where Jesus says, belief in God is unnecessary, for God can be but known. Score one for the atheist. (laughs) And then there are others that that have strange ideas about God. They're very anthropomorphic. You know, God sounds very much like a human God. And that's the God that the atheists can't buy. Zapping tribes and getting angry. And they say, that's ridiculous. A God that gets angry? I'm like, I'm totally with you. I totally, <laughs> I'm totally aligned with you on that. And... The point of our journey of forgiveness is to feel the connection and feel the love, to not try to separate, to not get into tit-for-tat over beliefs or theology. If there's only one belief, Jesus tells us, that takes us back to heaven, and that's forgiveness, I'm interested in joining in the experience of that belief. And to me, the way that I do that is I pray before my encounters and there, Jesus just gives me the words to use. And he'll put me, he puts words in my mouth, and they get all excited and light up. But it's all involuntary. I just have the prayer of my heart to connect with everyone. I, want to, I, I have no enemies. I'm here to connect with everyone, everyone that I meet, everyone that I think about in my mind. I'm there to connect with. That's the only purpose of thinking about people, is to connect with them in a, in a sense of of true, deep equality and love. So we're here together to, to come into an experience together. And for me, that is the most important thing. We're not here to debate theology. We're not here to compare and contrast the Course with the Bible or with the, the Gita or with the Quran. We're not here to compare and contrast different versions of the Course. Uh, We're not here to compare and contrast pathways that are said to be parallel to the Course. We're here to practice what has been given to us and by putting it into practice, by really giving our hearts over to it in a very devoted way, to go into an experience of that direct connection with God. God can be reached directly, but it also requires that we we be devoted to that purpose. We be devoted to truly practicing forgiveness with everything that appears. Just in terms of suggestions, I would not suggest trying to mix and match pathways. Uh, Pathways themselves are not real, but when you try to mix and match different terminology, different pathways, different pathways only seem to be different because they have different terminologies, different techniques, different practices, but clearly If you've come and you really feel the Course is your pathway, I would wholeheartedly recommend that you give yourself over to Jesus and to the Holy Spirit wholeheartedly to use the Course. Because when you try to make like a synthetic practice or a synthetic religion, it's almost like, you know, taking a a Ferrari or a BMW or a Mercedes or or a a very fine, fine motor car, and then as time goes on, you just think, I'm just going to use replacement parts. Replacement air filter, you know, how they have the manufacturer's (laughs) suggestion. Because the, the whole thing has been designed to function together very smoothly, coherently, harmoniously, 
And when you start putting on a lot of replacement parts into that engine, under that hood and everything, you seem to get problems because it wasn't designed really for replacements. We weren't really designed for this world. As I said, we were created in grace and Jesus says you will never be, be able to adapt or adjust to this world. You will never be able to adapt and adjust to time and space. Why? God didn't create it. Why? You're a perfect, holy, innocent child of God and you're only happy in your natural environment and that is spirit. That is eternity. You want to find eternal happiness. You really want to find ha happiness that lasts. You have to go to the environment where the happiness is. The kingdom of heaven is within. The Christ is our identity in the kingdom of heaven. Christ has not left the kingdom of heaven. A Course in Miracles is a pathway of bringing illusions to the truth. It doesn't want you to... There's nothing in the Course that says manifest. There's nothing in the Course that, that says that you should try to find the truth in the illusion. There's nothing in the Course that says bring God into this world and go around preaching God and talking about God and bringing God into your daily life. No, Jesus is saying what you perceive as your daily life is an illusion that is made up of beliefs and thoughts in your mind and you need to bring those beliefs and thoughts to the light within and they will disappear. But don't try to bring the light into the projection. This is a world of projection and the attempt, Jesus tells us that the projection is the attempt to get rid of something that you do not want. Well, the only way that you can actually get rid of something that you do not want, if you finally get to the point where you say, I do not want the ego, don't project the ego, because <laughs> that's not how you're going to let it go. You have to forgive it. You have to, you have to reel in the projections. Yes, of course you'll be tempted to get upset with people. You'll be tempted to get upset with, with temperatures, with noises, with sounds, with, with animals, with pets. You'll, you'll be tempted many, many times to get upset with something on the screen of the world. Tempted to be upset with the images. Something's not right with this picture. As the ego is always saying, something's not right with the picture. But it's always pointing to the picture. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm giving you a workbook that if you practice my workbook, it will train your mind to withdraw the projection. And when you start to realize, I'm never upset for the reason I think, and then when you start to realize, I can be hurt by nothing but my thoughts, you will start to bring your attention back to your mind. And that's exactly where the attention needs to be. Not on the people. Not on the situations, not on the things, not on the, the political dramas, Brexit and all these, and the, saving the environment and, and going green and doing all these things that are very either popular or unpopular depending on, on your beliefs. But Jesus is saying, no, you need to withdraw the projections and bring it back. Why do I have to do that? Because he's saying, to forgive, you first have to realize that these are all thoughts and beliefs in your mind. You're not going to be able to let it go as long as you're seeing it as outside of you. As long as you're seeing yourself as a person and all these things going wrong in this body and outside of this body, you're at the mercy of the ego. You've, you have bought the ego's belief system hook, line, and sinker. And you're sinking. Uh, you're a captive to the ego if you believe in the projection. But to the extent that you can withdraw the projection and just pay attention to your thoughts and just pay attention to your feelings and just pay attention to your beliefs, you are withdrawing the projection and you're bringing it back to your mind. Why is it so helpful? Why is that so absolutely helpful? Well, 
the ego made up this time-space cosmos to keep you mindless. It doesn't want to know that you even have a mind. You know, even in many scientists, they won't talk about the mind, they talk about the brain. But the brain's part of the body. The brain is a projection. You know those little neurotransmitters? The, that's not thinking, that's the projection of thought, those little neurotransmitters. That gray matter in there, that doesn't do any thinking. That gray matter is just gray matter. It's a projection. <laughs> it's a projection of the mind. So remember when you look at this world that this world was made by the ego to keep you mindless. To keep you mindless. Is any of you, when you were growing up, you know, you, you go to these classes, and you go to science classes, you go to biology class, you learn all these things, a bunch of hogwash, I'll tell you. I can tell you after 10 years of university, I, I now see that it was brainwashing, it was mindwashing. I was, I was off on ego pursuits trying to learn the much ado about nothing until I finally saw it was much ado about nothing. But people will say, well, a, a mother's instincts or a, an animal's instincts, the body doesn't have instincts. The body's a projection. Everything. Instincts are ego concepts projected onto the body. The reflex instinct. No. Your, your body doesn't even have a reflex instinct. That's just another concept. The whole ego belief system is concepts projected onto a screen for one reason, to make you mindless, to forget about your mind. Why is it so important that the ego is telling you to forget about your mind? Because it wants you to forget about your thoughts. And why would you want to forget about your thoughts except that somewhere deep down inside you believe that you've separated from God and you've tried to rip your thoughts apart, away from the Creator and that you've had the power to miscreate and you've had the power to make a whole new kingdom other, like, other than the real kingdom. You see, the ego's got a big story going on in there, like you need to make sure you stand clear of God because it's saying God will, will kill you, will strike you blind. God will destroy you if you ever come back. That's the whole ego teaching. He's, he goes saying, don't think you can just go back and get off scot-free. And the Holy Spirit is teaching, you never did what you thought you did. You could believe it, but you couldn't make it so. God isn't angry. God loves you. Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son over and over when, when he was on earth that the, even the son that seemed to squander his inheritance and was out feeding the pigs was welcomed back, back home. Come home. I love you so. That's the truth of it. We're being called home and welcomed home, and the ego's got this big, fearful puff of nothingness that's trying to convince us that we're guilty, that we've sinned, that... that God will, will kill us if we return. So these are the two thought systems that you're dealing with. One that's, that, that's all pure love, and the other one which is fear, guilt, sin, pain, suffering, and, and basically telling you, don't ever go clear, g close to God again, because you're going to suffer. So why is all the attention on the world and outcomes of the world? Because if you keep focusing on outcomes of the world, even basic things like, I got the job, or I got the partner, I got the child, I got the family, I got the house that I always wanted, I got a big screen TV in the house that I always wanted. You know, these are just outcomes. And the reason that the ego focuses, focuses on the outcomes because it doesn't want you to come in and discover that it's all happening in the mind. There, in Lesson 132, Jesus says, there is no world apart from what you think. That ideas leave not their source and everything that you're experiencing is an experience of, in mind. 
without exception. The quantum physicists who have been studying for decades, seven, going on eight decades of quantum physics, have been saying the same thing. There is no external world. There is no world apart from consciousness. Now, Jesus, of course, says consciousness is the domain of the ego, which is different than a lot of spiritualities, but still he's focusing on the correction. He's still focusing on the forgiveness, on the unified field, on the unified awareness. Jesus even says you're not responsible for the error. You are responsible for accepting the correction of the error. How loving can you be? How loving can you be? Even when you get it back to your mind, he's going to keep saying you're not responsible for the error. You're not responsible for the error at all. Here's the atonement. Our purpose is to accept the atonement. Your purpose is to do exactly what Jesus did and accept the atonement. Accept the correction. And it's in your thoughts. So, what a great way to spend your life. I feel so joined and connected with you because I am joined with you in this journey to accepting the correction. I am joined with you in not buying the bait of the opinions and the judgments and the conclusions of the world and say, let's not take our holy mind and put our attention on the distracted device that was made to keep us mindless. Let's return to our beautiful holy mind. Let's return to our glory. Let's return to our innocence. Let's return to our true happiness. Because it's that important. We were created by love to be loving and we won't be content until we experience that love. We will always be looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for love in too many faces like the country song said. We're always going to be looking in the wrong place unless we apply these teachings and apply these metaphysics. So that's my spiel for this morning. Uh, we do have seats for questions. We, we can take these beautiful teachings in metaphysics and apply them. In fact, Jesus wants us to take our seeming situations and issues of the world and to bring them to him and bring them to the light. And that's why we're here. We're here to join in that very holy purpose. Because we deserve that peace. We deserve that happiness. We don't need to be carrying burdens that we really have no business carrying anymore. So we have, do we have a microphone? There's the microphone, okay. Turn it we'll on. We'll make sure it's on. There we yes. go. And these are the seats here. So if you have a question or your heart is just about to burst open, Please come, and there's plenty of seats, so you can just come as you're ready and have your opportunity to take the mic and ask your question or share, and then you can head back to your seat to leave another open one. Okay, we have. Did you have a question or something? Okay, start here. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nina. Um... Yesterday evening, uh, you and Francis told us, so when you have something and you, f well, you feel uh, maybe, uh, well, <laughs> uh, frightened to share or y you feel this in your body, uh, I thought, oh, no, this is not going to happen. I will be seated in here in between everyone. And then this morning after the session with Neda, <laughs> there happened something to me and uh, well, afterwards, I felt this feeling, this strong feeling. No, I'm not going to share this. I'm afraid. Okay, then you have to go. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'm going to be seated on the front row, so here I am. Um, it happened afterwards, after the session, and, uh, well, I, I felt a lot, of, uh, a lot of emotion during the session with the, uh, the voice, with using the voice to, to give expression to well what you what you feel deep inside and afterwards i 
there came something about me that I, I really wanted to see and to love everyone over here, really to see everyone. And it was such a strong feeling and I, I wanted to, to stand still here in, in this place and let this feeling come over me. But I also got so frightened that there was something, oh, I, I, I will be crushed if I let this happen. <laughs> um, well... <laughs> I think it's this this feeling that was so so I didn't allow it uh, to to feel all this love uh in what in well I didn't allow it to myself to feel it and I I want to allow it so that's why I'm going sh- why I'm sharing it now <laughs> Thank you that's beautiful it it does like it puts the momentum in it toward that when you share it because you've made your declaration you've made a public declaration even when two people become married you know the reason that they have like a marriage ceremony is because they want to declare their love and their devotion in front of of their friends and family and we are your friends and family and we love you so dearly and we appreciate that you're really making that declaration because it's in some way it's it's like a symbol a symbol of I, this is important to me, and I don't want to just hold it in or push it down. I want this to be known. I want this to come into my life, into my, into fruition. So thank you, thank you for that. We all join you in that that prayer. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. It's working. Um, I have a question about um, listening to your inner voice, uh, following uh, the Holy Spirit. As you know, um, it's fast one year ago that uh, Monique and uh, Rainier invited you uh, for this retreat, and you said yes, and then the preparation starts, and we have a lot of communication with the Living Miracle team, and um, we noticed um, that there was a lot of um, difference in looking to things, uh, to all kinds of things, important things, like we thought they were important, like prizes, like the grace funds, like refundable and not refundable, all that kind of maybe important things, but also small things like how do you devise um, a participant list in three pieces for a good registration. And um, I'm convinced that we both, uh, Living Miracle Teams and Monique and I, were following the Holy Spirit's uh, 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 lead. and But we also feel quite uncomfortable often that we get, it looks like, different answers. So we had a sort of advanced opportunity to go beyond, again and again, go beyond and look for unity and um, look for happiness and not to be right. Um, um, But... When I'm honest, I was quite relieved that two days ago we could handle the whole thing over to the Living Miracles team (laughs) when you arrived here. And my question is, um, (laughs) it looks like there is a Dutch Holy Spirit (laughs) and an American one or an international one, maybe. But that's, of course, absolute nonsense, uh, we know. Um, So, um, one of us, or both of us, uh, did probably uh, listen not quite well. (laughs) Or maybe there's another opportunity that the Holy Spirit wants to give us us an advanced chance for forgiveness. Maybe I like to hear, or I like to hear your opinion. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah, when you were describing it, I was, I was thinking of, of a tennis metaphor of uh, Roger Federer. They formed recently the Labor Cup 
and the two sides on the labor cup was Europe and the rest of the world. <laughs> that's the that's the teams. <laughs> but basically everything is for the opportunity of forgiveness and and not only what what you do comes from what you think, but also how you feel. There is a point in the Course where Jesus does say that the one right use of judgment is how do you feel. I, when I saw that in there, I thought, that's important. The one right use of judgment is how do you feel. What I saw from that was Jesus was saying, your feelings are like your barometer. Your feelings tap us into what lies beneath, you know, and and he does even go so far as to tell us that that our feelings come from what we want, what we believe, and what we think. That feelings are literally a byproduct of those things. What we want, what we believe, and what we think. And yet, most of what the human being believes and and thinks and and oftentimes even feels and and certainly desires is is unconscious so to me when i look at collaborations whether it's a relationship whether it's a marriage whether it's a collaboration to do an event it's a huge opportunity to get in touch with what is unconscious i was always interested Having studied psychology, I was quite fascinated with Carl Jung calling it the shadow, uh, fascinated with this unconscious. And there was one point in my work with the Course where I was saying, I don't know how I'm, I feel like I've got so much buried and so much in my unconscious, I have no idea how to even tap into that. And Jesus said, yeah, that's that's my job. I, I do. <laughs> I know how. And he he would guide me to music stores to get certain kind of music, to watch certain kind of films. Films that I can't even imagine watching. Like, I remember one point Jesus guided me to watch this movie, Seven, with uh, Brad Pitt. And it was about the seven deadly sins. And it was so graphic and so gross and everything. And I'm, I'm sitting there like, <laughs> oh my. God. And he's like, yep, this is, uh, I'm doing my job here, We're doing, getting the roto-rooter out here to get those clogged thoughts and beliefs and feelings up. And of course, that with Netta doing voice liberation, it's this, that's another very helpful technique to, to get in touch with the unconscious feelings and what lies be beneath. Um, some people use like uh, breath work, circular uh, breathing is another technique. Some people use psychedelics, uh, you know, ayahuasca, uh, and say that that's been effective. And for those of us that have kind of been around, we know that that there's there are different ways of 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 bringing it more to the surface that we may release it. Uh, for me, I always see these events as really just huge forgiveness opportunities. I don't see them as like situations in and of themselves. I see them more from a more of a quantum perspective like, wow, everyone who participates, that's the reason that they're here. Before uh, I came over today to do this session, I was part of another meeting and there was talk about food and movements of people for food and I just prayed. I was just part of the meeting listening to the Holy Spirit because I want it to be the most efficient, beautiful, wonderful, flowing experience that it can be. And so we had a discussion of praying about food and movements of people and so forth. About, oh, we have a forecast of rain. I don't want people coming in here dripping wet. Uh, I want them to be here feeling comfortable and well settled and very receptive while they're listening. Um, last night we had a discussion, brief discussion afterwards too about the sound and the best, the equipment to use that would be the best so, and uh, extraneous kind of sounds and things to, to make sure that it's the most high quality receptive experience. So there is a lot of prayer that goes into these things and I do feel like this journey to really this inner listening is a very high calling. 
but we do have the feelings as the barometer. And when we join together, whether it's in a relationship, a marriage, a collaboration, there will be emotions that will come up. And that's a good thing, I think. I, I feel like we have repressed emotions. Let's let them come to the surface and let's get at what's underneath them so we can forgive. So for me, I, I just feel such gratitude because, as I mentioned, whether it was that dinner with, with Coase and Doris and Monique, whether it's the collaborations with you and, and Monique and the, the crew that have been doing all these logistical things that require a lot of care and attention, I always feel underneath it's all for reaching a state of healing and forgiveness. And I feel like that's what I've done is train my mind to see that purpose in everything. So I'm not looking outward toward the the conclusion of thing or the outcomes, but I'm feeling that joy and that happiness from forgiveness and then that just radiates out. That's my job. I really am hoping everybody starts to see that's our that's our job. <laughs> you know, we're we're here to be happy and to forgive, but we have to be able to openly lay things on the table. Part of what I was talking about in the morning meeting today was speaking up. You know, so often we've been raised to kind of stuff feelings and to not talk about things openly, to not put things on the table, but to kind of just stuff them, stymie them, push them down, and then be the quiet, strong type, you know, just hold it together. Meanwhile, underneath there's all this stuff going on and it doesn't feel good. And so that was part of my talk with the, with the group this morning was like, I, I want to encourage open expression and, with the purpose of forgiveness. Because that's the purpose. It's not just saying stuff reason for any reason or for just f because of saying it, but it's because we can come down in a much faster way, I think, to, to the forgiveness. So, yeah, th that's something I've faced for like 33 years because on my early travels, uh, as I was going around to groups and whatever, I would show up and they would start to use, a, they would put a very interesting word in front of the Holy Spirit. I always put the in front of the Holy Spirit, and they were using the word my, my Holy Spirit. And I said, this is the strangest thing I've ever heard. What are you calling the Holy Spirit? My Holy Spirit. And then I heard your Holy Spirit, and I was like, hmm, that sounds, <laughs> sounds kind of dualistic. <laughs> my Holy Spirit, your, but yet this is the temptation of the ego, even to divide the Holy Spirit up. I've heard people do that with with just about everything in this world. Even with Jesus, um, I, I really, it's kind of interesting to see multiple Jesuses, you know. Some people say, no, it's Jesus of Palestine. They say, oh no, no that's not Jesus, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And then people say, well, you know there's a Jesus of the Course, and then there's the Jesus of the Bible. And I'm like, oh, this is getting way too confusing for me. <laughs> I mean, two Jesuses. It's like, well, yeah, they're different. And I'm like, oh, now, and Jesus is different too. Now it's like the, the, the presence is asking us to see everything the same. To, it's calling us into forgiveness and unified perception is not going to be focused on differences. Even with the Course in Miracles, we had the first edition, the second edition, the third edition, the fourth edition, the fifth edition, and people will ask me that, like, why does Jesus have five editions? Uh, I have people like I was in California a while back, and they were telling me, they said, yeah, they were telling me about the good old days back in the seventies, and and the Course groups, and they said, yeah, we we just had one book. Um, everybody could go to the same page, you know, turn to the text, page 342, and everybody could turn. Nowadays, the t I was talking to my friend, he's a psychotherapist, he facilitates a course group in Northern California, and and it takes so long because they, 
the people all come with their own editions. Okay, now turn to page so and so in the first edition, and page so and so in the second edition, page third, so and so in the third, and they can hardly get to the question of what's the question because they've got to get it takes 10 minutes to get everybody on the same page and they were reminiscing like with nostalgia back oh I wish we could go back to those old days of the course where we could actually get to the the piece of scripture <laughs> and ask our question because we could actually find it without digging digging the one thing that I'm noticing too is is that this entire world is coming, springing from, all of time and space springs from the belief that I can create myself and what's a, a follow-up belief from I can create myself, I can do it better. That's another version of I, I can create myself as I can do it better. We have the first edition of the course, is that good enough? to read, to practice, to put into practical application, to zoom into self-realization and enlightenment. Oh, I can do it better. And then the third edition, I can do it better. And then the fourth edition, I can do it better. And then the fifth edition, I can do it better. And you notice that happens with human beings, with relationships. You know, they have a, a, a marriage, a relationship, and then I think I can do better. I think I can do better, 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 better. I think the practical application requires facing all types of uncomfortable feelings. You mentioned you, there were uncomfortable feelings. Yeah, that's the parable of David. It's like, okay, here we go, another wave. Where did you come from? You know, oh, the unconscious. Oh, yeah, that's right. I ask. There's one place where Jesus actually gave another word for the unconscious mind, and he called it, it was very fascinating to me, he called it the unwatched mind. I thought, wow, that is cool. Unconscious, unwatched, unaware. And if, if this character in the surface, this dream figure, seems to be at the mercy of these unconscious beliefs and thoughts, if everything this this body thinks and says and does is all part of a prearranged plan that's all acting out unconscious beliefs, then I better get in touch with that unconscious because I need to be aware. How can I be happy if I'm not even aware of what's going on? I like it in the Course too, where Jesus says, you don't know how you how you got here. Even if we say, we don't know how we seemed to get here. <laughs> we put the seemed word in. We don't know how we seemed to get here. It still comes down to that thing because Jesus is really telling us because if you knew, you wouldn't have the question and you wouldn't perceive yourself as you perceive yourself now if you knew. But this whole idea of separation has been pushed out of awareness the whole idea of how the mind works has been pushed out of awareness. And Jesus says, your great need is instruction in perception. I like that. I, he's like the master psychologist who's telling us, you really have a strong need of, of learning about how the mind works in perception, only that you can come then to a decision to see that you never separated to see that the separation never happened. That's just the building blocks. That's just the inroads to take you to that. And so, yeah, I, I always appreciated. Um, I did get little bits and pieces where people would say, this, and this is what they feel, and they strongly feel this and strongly believe. And, and so I could hear the sprinkling of, of different things. And... And still I trust so much in the Holy Spirit that, that I think, well, I'm, I'm going to show up and have a ball. Uh, I'm going to have joy and have fun, and I'm going to trust Holy Spirit is going to arrange things. Also, I think it helps that when I traveled around the world for these, into these 44 countries, that's really how it started for me was I would meet somebody and somebody would offer me like 
air tickets or they would say to me, you need to go to South America, you need to go to Argentina. Have you ever been there? I'd say, no. Do you speak the language? No. And, and yet it would be like a little plant. And then all of a sudden somebody I, sh I see in a park says he, he had a, entered a, a South America airline contest and he won the grand prize of frequent flyer miles. I say, really? And he said, yeah, I won a million frequent flyer miles. Well, that's got my attention. And then he's saying, you should go to Argentina. And then he's saying he's got a million frequent flyer miles. And then he's saying, I want to fly you and you pick three other people. I'll fly all four of you, ejecutiva, executive, first class. Oh, I'm, I'm game. I mean, you know, you see, this is how the guidance works. It just makes it possible. Jesus is not going to give you a goal of atonement without giving you the means to reach the goal. And when I say means, uh, it comes down to barns like this, to flying first class. I, I was not a first class flyer. I didn't even fly that much, much less ever fly that. And then now I find myself on a plane to Argentina and they're serving me wine and, and I'm thinking, whoo, this, I better really get out of the driver's seat here. This is pretty spectacular. It just went, that was just, it went on and on and on for decade after decade of, of Jesus arranging time and space as he said he would. If you will be a miracle worker for me, I will arrange time and space for you. Airline tickets, barns, travels, you know, staying with people, you know, it's, it's so unhuman. You know, we're not raised to think that we have some kind of spirit or guardian angel that's going to arrange our travel. I mean, you know, it's one thing to trust the Holy Spirit, you know, please give me guidance, but, but actually to arrange the aspects of time and space so that if everything flows for a greater purpose. To me, that's been the most convincing, is that things work out. So I did trust that, uh, that this would work out, and, um, and I did trust that if, if it was meant to be for forgiveness, that you would ask the question in the session, and there you come right out of the box. The first question. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for doing that. For everyone, thank you for doing that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, things we met in uh, 2016 in the first, you know, I think as, as a group, you know, you could yes. thank you and Kristen and uh, Francis for your sharing your guidance uh, through all those years. I have one practical question. Reading, reading your um, new website of the Living Miracles, I came across uh, mentioning uh, church ministries. And reading further down, I read the word church. And you even listened as senior pastor, Kirsten, uh, executive pastor, pastor. Very, very uh, interesting. And even uh, Seema Kanija as um, delegated reverend. Is it, is it going to be a kind of a church or whatever? Could you please expand, Dave? You know the discussion about churches, about <laughs> medical churches, Wapnik and, oh, yeah. and Piri and whatever, and John uh, uh, Monroe. So please, could you please expand so that we do not for, uh, you know, misunderstand this? Yes, yes. Well, that, that whole church symbol actually came in many, many years ago uh, when... Kirsten had come over from New Zealand to the United States and initially we had no church, there's no church symbol, we were not using that word at all. I would probably as I'm traveling around as a mystic teaching around the world talk about the church within, you know, that state of devotion, reverence, but not a church in terms of an organization, not the church in terms of of roles and positions and so forth. Initially, 
when I was teaching back in the 1990s, one of my students came to me around, I think, 1998, maybe in the beginning of 1999, and I was just happily going my way, shining my light, and going wherever I would go. And his name was Thomas, and he came to me and he said, you're going to be traveling all over the world, and you're going to be speaking to many people and reaching many people. It was almost like a prophecy of the things to come. I said, no, really, because I, I don't think about those things. And he said, um, in terms of people wanting to support your mission and so forth, people may want to donate money. And this is a world where money is watched. <laughs> Unlike the unconscious mind, which is the unwatched mind, the, the movement of money in terms of money laundering, in terms of taxation, in terms of practicality, he was basically saying um, he had very strong guidance to set up a nonprofit organization. And so I said, well, if that's what you feel, I said, but who will be the director? And he said, I will be the director, not me, but him. He would be the director, he would do it for, to assist in the purpose of sharing this message around the world. I said, okay, and that's fine. So then, as soon as you set up a nonprofit organization, you, you have interactions with the government, because these are legal entities. You know, anybody knows with a nonprofit organization, it's a legal entity. You have to have bylaws, you have to have articles of incorporation, you have to have uh, trustees and or board members, secretaries, directors, presidents, all that stuff. And so he set the whole thing up and he said, the government of the United States is called IRS, Internal Revenue Service. They have some questions that need to be answered. Uh, and one thing that they wanted way back then, from the 90s, was what are some of the things that you produce, or what do you do? What do you produce? And so I said, well, just send them in a copy of the first edition of Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. So this is where it gets interesting. You send the government the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. What comes back from the government was a whole list of questions. One of the questions was, what does one person's opinions about movies have to do with spiritual awakening. This is from the government. So I had to pray and write, <laughs> if you're going to go through this, because after about a year or so, he said, I'm stepping down as a director. He said to me, you're the director now. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. You know. Since that, I've been in other countries, like in China. I was over in China one time, and I'm going through the airport in uh, Beijing, and I keep seeing this man's poster all over the place. As I'm walking around, I'm like, who is this guy? And they said, oh, he's, he's one of the most powerful men in China. He has very powerful uh, nonprofit um, organization over here in China, and does many work to help many, many people. I said, really? Fascinating. I end up getting invited by this guy uh, to, to meet his daughter and his wife and everything, and we're having dinner, and he looks over and he says, would you be on my nonprofit uh, board? When I'm in China, in, in Beijing, and I'm saying, oh, please, I've got I've, I'm enough of those symbols. So anyway, to fast forward this, um, this original foundation, Foundation for the Awakening Mind, no mention of church, talk about forgiveness, A Course in Miracles, awakening, all that stuff in the bylaws. We're using that as a symbol because Kirsten has come across and, and to, in order for her to stay in the United States during the very, very beginnings, back in the mid-2000s, she had to have a, a legal way to stay. It's not like St. Francis where they're all Italians. Uh, you know, they all come, let's move out of Assisi, let's move down to this broken down church, the San Damiano, and let's devote our lives to re restoring this church and repairing it and living devotional lives for God. They're all Italians. And then here comes Claire. Now she's a woman. 
Oh, they got men, and they got haircuts, and now they got a woman, and they're all still Italians. And they didn't have visa th questions or immigration questions. It just wasn't, you know, back in that story, it wasn't part of that parable. But there was a point where um, Kirsten received a notice that, um, that in order to have her, it's called an R1, religious visa, it was with the foundation, it had nothing to do with churches, in order to have that renewed, uh, we would have to come into the immigration office. So Kirsten had to go in there for an interview, and then I had to go in there, because remember, I got put in as the director. So now I'm in this immigration office, and I'm sitting down to do this immigration interview because Kirsten's wanting to get her religious visa renewed. And the woman just smiles at me, this is the government, and she looks at me and she slides a photograph across to me of Mary Ann Williamson. And she says to me a question, this is the first question from the government, not about the movie watcher's guide, and this is years later, is this your guru? <laughs> and I said, no, she's not my guru. But she has shared a lot about A Course in Miracles on Oprah Winfrey, and she's popularized A Course in Miracles, and the government official said, I know. And therefore, all the questions came. In the end, Kirsten was denied her religious visa for whatever, you know, of course the miracles can seem a little out of the box <laughs> as far as for government officials and so forth. And so Kirsten was told, you need to leave the country immediately, immediately. And she did, she came over to Ireland and her mother was there, our friend Sarah, and they had a gathering and it was part of just flowing with the symbols. Then there was a point we had a discussion where we all prayed, we had prayed right before she left about that and Kirsten heard in her mind that Jesus said you need to have the church, you need to use the church symbol. Again, it's just a neutral symbol like all the other ones but it was given as a, a guidance and at that time she turned over to Jason and Jason was like, I'm not hearing that. Church! <laughs> I'm not hearing that at all. So we had to keep praying with it, praying with it and I would have to say that that, that symbol was brought in and it has been used to kind of open doors, all kinds of doors, even though they're all just symbols, it's just been used. So this is not something that was done, again, with an intention to establish anything. I f am full aware, like you are, of the history of churches. <laughs> and certainly in Europe, uh, you know, it goes way, way, way back. And church and state issues and all those kind of things, I'm very well aware of those things. But it was just a symbol, almost like you were wear to wear a jacket or a sweater it's just a symbol, wear, the, wear it lightly, and Jesus saying, let me use it. it. It will be beneficial to your mind's awakening if it's used by me. If you start to take it as a, as a real thing, and you start to make it real in any way, that's making the error real. Because you can't bring spirit into form. You can't organize. Uh, spirit can't be organized. And he even says that in the workbook, in Lesson 135. You can't activate the past, organize the present, or plan the future in order to stay in this beautiful state of, of awareness, of connectivity. So, you saw that as a website. That website probably has been around for a while. It's not a, a, a symbol that comes into use a lot. Uh, certainly, on our world travels and and our journeys around, the, the symbol has come into play occasionally. Um, it it could get you in to visit a prisoner, uh, in terms of into a prison. Sometimes they just don't want any old ordinary citizen uh, walking into a a maximum security prison or whatever. It it's kind of like a little key that can open some doors occasionally in a in a helpful way like the airline tickets and, 
everything else, but it's definitely not something that uh, that we hold as a as an identity. And if people ask me about that, I always come back to, yeah, it's it's what's in your mind and what's in your heart. It's it can't be spirituality cannot be organized. It's it can be experienced, but it can't be organized. You in fact you lose the experience if you if you buy into uh, the organization. Thank you very much. Actually, one last question. I've been in China after you, and I had a book, the first uh, translation, and, don't, I don't, and I don't speak Chinese because I'm a Chinese uh, brought up in Indonesia. So at last I gave it to my Qigong master, which was very, very uh, informed and very, very uh, low ego minded. Yeah. Um, could you please? Uh, let us know when you're visiting China again. I would love to join, you know, if you could. Yeah, thank you. I will. It's beautiful. It, it has been a beautiful going there. And actually, there were almost like two different uh, versions that were spoken about of of a of different kind of uh, of different kind of languaging um, with the course even there and. There was like an official translation, and there was another one with it was a different type. So even with with that, we we're very curious. We just go there, we meet people, we join, we listen, uh, and it's it's all about extending the love and, and the joy. So yeah, make, make sure I have your contact details. We do have invitations over there. Uh, uh, Francis has been getting some invitations from China. Is that with the, with the uh, house uh, child, uh, ha house church organization, uh, the underground, or is it just with the official one? Because I was invited for the for the uh, forbidden uh, house uh, churches. Last minute, you know, I, I refrained from going because I knew I was followed. So you know, it's for their safety sometimes, you know, <laughs> to be very very low profile in in contacting them. Are you uh, contacting them, or is it another group, or an own group? Well, this was a group that we met the very first visit. Uh, uh, and the organizer's name is uh, Bin Bin, and she actually has quite a following of of students that have been with her for many, many years. So it goes all the way back to her original contact. But um, I have had so much fun there because a lot of the groups that I went to were kind of hidden groups. Uh, they weren't public at all. And then... One time I did a whole tour uh, through Hainan and Shanghai and Beijing, and then when I got to Beijing, I was to do a big talk at a, at a hotel. And the night before the talk, uh, probably around 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, the organizer came to me and said, uh, we think uh, we should cancel the talk. And this was a big talk with a big hotel with many people. And the organizer said, actually, there, there has been some things moving around a bit where they, they have been starting to, uh, to um, associate A Course in Miracles, Ho Opono Pono, and Osho's work together. In particular, Osho's work, the the government and the society, they said it, the sexual things that were part of the teachings of Osho were directly against uh, traditional Chinese values. So the Course in Miracles, Osho, and Ho'oponopono were being lumped together as a threat, uh, as a threat. And so they said, we feel like if you do this talk at this, uh, I think it was on a Saturday at this hotel, that you may be detained uh, by the government, uh, and they may detain you. Uh, they have arrested the teacher already of the Osho, uh, who was teaching Oshos, and they were very concerned for that. Well, to me, you know, doing a talk at a hotel or meditating is really the same to me, uh, because it's, I just see everything as the same. So I did say to the organizer, well, if, if you really feel this is, you, you've organized an whole event. Imagine canceling 
an event like this. They organized the whole event. The organizer was then saying, I think we need to move you from this hotel immediately. I said, now? Do it now. <laughs> yes. We want you and your whole group to we'll move you to another hotel and we're going to cancel the whole event. And then they said, that leaves an open day for you tomorrow. What would you like to do? I said, oh, I'd, I'd like to meditate with everybody. Can we get a group to meditate together? That would be cool. They said, we have the largest indoor hot tub and spa in the world here in Beijing. There's trees inside there. I said, a spa with trees? And they said, yeah. There's a restaurant. That's perfect. Get a big group. So they got like 15, 18 people, and we went and meditated in the hot pools instead of doing a big talk at a hotel. Absolutely delightful. I have no preference in terms of the way the script is written or in terms of the way that it plays out, but I do feel I love the, the sharing of the love and the connectedness and we, oh, we had so much fun meditating, eating wonderful food and curling up, uh, sitting under the trees, you know, all indoors. Uh, so it just turned into a wonderful experience. But that's what I mean by being so flexible that even a canceling of an entire event and moving hotels was fine with me, you know. I'm just happy to, to float along like a twig in the river. And, uh, yeah, worked out. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. That's beautiful. Okay, do we have any more questions? We've got a whole row over here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, I wanted to lift up something that has been coming again and again in my mind um, about like what the ego would love to call the unforgivable. Um, like every crime or sin or whatever you want to call it, like people committing murder or rape or any, like the really violent and yeah, you s talked about the movie Seven, that was kind of <laughs> yeah, interesting that uh, were those things that the ego keeps coming with, with like that card, but th th this could not be something that you forgive. I mean, you can go on with your Course in Miracles stuff all day, but when, you, when it comes down to these things, you, you cannot be sure that, that these things are also forgivable. So, and I'm, I'm really feeling that this is kind of holding me back because I don't, I can't walk past that. I, I hit this spot where the ego throws this in and I'm like, yeah, I really feel those things are dreadful and I can't like break through those. I can't see them really in a different light. And um, yeah, so, so I, I'm just asking you to speak about that and maybe uh, see if I can... Um, yeah, get a new way to look at those things. So that won't be like a wall anymore. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Lainey. It's actually, um, um, Netta sent to me a, um, a movie before I came here, and she had met, I think, the director of it, also the director of The Secret. They put together this movie called The the power of, was it the heart? Power of the heart. And then she mentioned, she, I said, I'm starting, I'll get, watch it a little bit here and there. And she said, no, go to like the 36 minute point because that's the point that really is the most impactful out of the whole movie. And so I got Francis and uh, Kirsten and I said, Ned has told us, we're, I'll, I'm willing to watch the whole thing. They said, you even want to watch the beginning? I said, yeah, I'll watch the beginning again. I like it. So we went there and then we watched that part. And the part that Netta had pointed out was a beautiful little segment in there about the, the genocide in Rwanda, where over a million people were killed. And not just just killed, but, but with machetes were sliced up uh, with blood 
everywhere and and the the pol politics and the tribe but it was beautiful because the woman in there had had gone with a with a group of women and and some a couple of children and they the a pastor had come and brought them uh into this tiny little shower where they all huddled and they thought they'd be in there maybe for hours but it went on for a long long time weeks they were actually in there and they couldn't even turn the shower on without they had to wait till the toilet flushed at another bathroom in the house and it was a very extreme facing the the anger facing the perception of having her literally her whole family her brother her parents the whole family was basically slaughtered while she was in this little shower and facing all the emotions in a very tight tiny space but that segment was so powerful because what it did was it it brought her into her emotions in a very direct way and it also brought her to face her thoughts her own rage thoughts her thoughts of murder of revenge she had to face it like so right in front of her it brought everything up and so there was another point when another group of men with machetes had come around and she was talking to the pastor and basically she heard very clearly in her mind there was a big cabinet outside of where the door was that the, that the pastor was to close the door to the shower move the cabinet in front of the that door so that these men would not find these group of women and and children and then when the men came with their machetes she could even hear them calling her name and looking for her and everything but she because she followed that guidance um they did make it through and at one point then she did even get to go into the prison because the man was arrested and it was so powerful because she got to face the man who had killed her family and he couldn't really maintain much of an eye contact with her and 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 yet she had known the man it was a teacher of hers from when she was younger but the whole segment is is a very very much of a, of a really what you're asking for you're asking for the ego is running a number on me because of the extreme things like oh you know you can't do this to to listen to this woman witness all that she went through the transformations and to go in to meet the man and to offer forgiveness uh, which even brought up anger and rage in the in the the man that had brought her in to even allow her to do this you know he thought she would she, he gave her a club to beat the man and she forgave the man instead and that brought up rage in the man who brought the club it was it was a beautiful beautiful segment thank you so much netta for for showing that but i feel that whether we do it as a group or whether we are able to uh watch that segment that would be a very healing a way to because it shows the value of forgiveness that she so much didn't want to carry this anger with her for her peace of mind for her connection with god and it brought that part in which the ego never goes there it never tells you the benefits of forgiving it just tries to ridicule the mind that way and also I also watched another show I believe it was on uh, Netflix called Kindness Diaries where the man was going down from Alaska all the way down to uh South America Argentina with his Volkswagen Beetle little Volkswagen Beetle and having all these encounters and he did meet a woman who had been to Rwanda and who had been a lawyer who was astounded because she came there sometime after the massacres and to see some of the people were so bright-eyed and so happy she could not fathom how a million people could be murdered and how these people could have such joy she just was struck by the joy on the on the 
the faces of these people, and she she asked them, "What is it? How how can you be happy in the in the face of of the genocide that just occurred?" And they said the same thing. I I had to forgive in order to to establish my connection with God, with love. That they they could see it was their own unforgiveness that was blocking them from feeling the happiness and joy, and so they did the most sensible thing for them was to forgive. But it just for this lawyer who came from another country who was visiting, she was astounded that they were capable even of of that. And I think with you studying the course, you know, you're just getting the the how. It's just coming in in a very, very clear way. But I think what you just need is a few more of these kind of examples that show you the forgiveness kind of acted out and witnessed to. And, and I think that will be the thing that will help it pop in your mind. Beautiful. Hi, David. Hi there. I constantly hear a voice telling me it is so unimportant what you want to share. So you better stop it. But I won't because I want to heal. I worked with your latest book and it moved me very much, especially the chapter on healing and I ask the Holy Spirit, what is it in my mind that my body gives me so much experiences of pain? And then last week, things steadily came up with memories from the past. And uh, and I saw that my whole life I, I always had to do the best I, I could, even with the course, which I started 12 years ago, and even with your book. So there is so much tension in my mind and also in my, in my body. And I don't want it anymore. So this morning, I was sitting next to a human angel. And we had a short talk. And she said to me, Jesus loves you. <laughs> and that moved me so much. <laughs> so, I know what I have to uh, just... I don't want to the same me as I was before. But I don't know yet what is the new me. So I, I feel helpless. And I never allowed myself to be helpless. I always was strong. I knew the best. I was the leader. And I'm exhausted by that, that attitude. So I'm constantly asking for help, and there are so many helpful people here around me, so many angels, so I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's so beautiful that you see the opportunity to just allow the love, allow yourself to be loved, to wash away this kind of belief that I have to be the strong one and I have to hold it together. And um, it can be such a deeply ingrained belief that, that 
that anything like breaking down or crying or showing emotions can be associated with weakness when actually that's, that's very much a part of the process, almost like cracking open uh, to be loved, to be allowing ourselves to be loved, to be helped. And I feel like that's one of the great advantages of this kind of gathering. Uh, when I first started going to gatherings too many, many years ago, even before the course, uh, I felt this strong call to one time to go to a, it was Association of Humanistic Psychology, uh, the same organization where I, I, I came across the course out in California. But, and I just, there were so many experiential exercises, there was so many people just coming up and, and with so much love in their hearts and, and in their eyes and, and I just could feel almost like a shield going up in my mind like, oh my God, this is too much, this is overwhelming. But that's, we have to allow that and we have to allow ourselves to, to be loved and nurtured. And so you're, you're not here by accident, you're here to express like you did and really the prayer of your heart is to just welcome it. And, and to give yourself a whole week, too, is a, is a very beautiful, spacious opportunity. So, I th I'm so grateful that you shared that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you. Hi, David. Hello. <laughs> um. Uh, I'm, I'm not sh quite sure how to put the words on it, but I'll try. Um, all the talk about experience. Um, I realized that uh, the couple of weeks before coming here, um, I have, I've really stressed myself um, <laughs> kind of in order to get everything ready <laughs> so I could come here and um, and relax and kind of <laughs> some kind of expectations too that how it should be so with your talk yesterday and today too i really looked at it and and can uh, oh what 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 really is going on like all the time uh, in the background is something like I can really I, I feel that I can see the patterns I can see what I'm doing to myself uh, and I can really feel that it's not nice and it doesn't feel good um, and uh, I It's kind of um, I think the the difficult part is for me to just to let it all go and accept things as as they are and to um, <laughs> to ask for help. Yeah, but the expectations is really kind of big. Yeah, it's so beautiful that you can share that because we can see that the investment in the 
make believe or the fictitious self has has been a big investment. It's been so much effort put into the building and the maintaining of of the mask. It's a heavy mask, and and it takes a lot of maintenance and it takes a lot of work to to make, to prop it up to to keep it thick to keep it strong and in maintaining the mask too there's a there's like a heartbreak of wow this is does it really have to be this way is there is there nothing else i can do or is there no other way to be except this accustomed repetitive heavy heavily armored mask and i think once you start to gain a, a little hint a little clue that there is another way and you start to let me use the word responsibility you start to realize that that there's so much responsibility projected onto this body and this world that it's very heavy in fact jesus at one point says the world is very tired it's like this tired weary repetition of projected responsibility and i put plural re projected responsibilities that that was part of the stress that you felt for the last couple of weeks of even giving yourself permission to come that you had to almost feed this dragon feed this responsibilities monster and show that you were dutiful and obedient and make sure that it was this responsibilities monster was well fed before you went off to frolic and dance and play and be happy in your spiritual week for me that was a major teaching of the course was was Jesus saying in two different places once the the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself and then another place the sole responsible of the teacher of god is to accept this correction accept the atonement for himself and that is a total reversal of the thinking the programming of everything that we've had from from a baby on it's in the mind but it just plays out in the whole human development take responsibility we have to take responsibility for the a body when you become a fully functioning adult you know you take responsibility for that if you have children you have to take responsibility for children if you have a house you have to take responsibility for maintaining and cleaning the house and if you have a garden you have to maintain the garden if you have a lawn <laughs> even on around that house you have to mow the grass you it's like a world of false responsibilities that just the mind gets heavier and heavier and heavier it's more like a zombie like the walking dead where you have no energy left because you've got to keep handling all these spinning plates if you if you don't spin all the plates you don't run around spinning the plates the plates will fall off the pole and will crash and your whole world will come crashing down so coming here is a is a great stride of of starting to realize that your state of mind is important that your peace of mind is extremely important and so much of the 33 years with the course and my travels around the world has been going and being invited into homes where we sat at the kitchen table we sat at the living room we sat and talked and people unburdened themselves saying my life is so heavy and so stressed can you please join with me and me joining with them in encouragement for their their inward journey how how they're doing it for the whole universe that they're how they're not really letting people down by devoting their life to forgiveness they're actually if the inner selves of these people could talk they would be cheering you on go for it please 
set all the captives free, please, you know, all the heroes' journeys of, of do the inner work to free the whole universe of this burdensome egoic belief system. So it's just so beautiful that you can can come forward and just speak it up. Because like the first woman who spoke right there in the same chair, it was like a declaration of, I am worth this. I am worthy of forgiveness. And as Jesus says, it is the privilege of the forgiven to forgive. Once we take Jesus' course, we start to come in contact with, oh my gosh, the, the forgiveness is joyful, it's light, it's laughter, there's, there's happiness with it. And when we give ourselves over to that state of mind, it is our honor, it is our privilege to radiate that love and light and extend that, to set all the captives free. And that's what you're doing. You're, this is part of your uh, miracle worker training. <laughs> To, to really allow yourself to come here and immerse in this. And then, I know for myself, I've had people that have written me emails and letters, just hundreds and thousands of referring back to, oh, I met you back in such and such a year, my life has never been the same, I thank you so much for this book or, or this YouTube video or the light bulb went off in my mind when I saw this thing. But I get a lot of witnesses to that of just me being steadfast and having the faith to go for this as like a devotion and life's calling. The, the witnesses just come flooding in. They just come on and on like waves of, of witnesses. You made the right choice. You went the right direction. You know, even people who had, the last time I saw them they had kind of stormed off They'll write me a year later saying, I don't know what I was thinking. Thank you so much. You know, even the, the witnesses just turn, turn, turn toward the light. And you're doing it. You're doing it for, for the whole universe. So thank you. I offer the gratitude, the blessings. Jesus is so, so grateful for your willingness. So grateful. Thank you. Beautiful. Well, we still have time here. We're rolling along. Hi, David. Hi there. Um, I've, I've um, just spent the last month with Sarah, and um, <laughs> the beginning of September, um, she came up to the west coast of Canada, and I invited her into my home, and <laughs> we we both thought. I was hosting her for gatherings and watching a few movies, having fun. And <laughs> what um, seemed to happen was that we, um, or I, stumbled uh, across a tripwire um, for myself. And, um, and we recognized that she, Spirit had brought her in as um, the answer to a very deep prayer um, that I had um, communicated with Jesus, with Holy Spirit, um, a month or so before, of asking, is there a faster way to do this? The healing, I was felt very devoted, and um, but it seemed quite arduous. And um, so I asked for clarity and prayed for a, a faster way. So Sarah appeared on the scene, and um, something happened that 
um, cause the exposure of uh, all my desires to remain entangled <laughs> um, in my mind, the desire to um, maintain my old way of being, um, my little life, my comfort, uh, the desire to do healing my own way, um, uncovered the belief in hurt and spite, and uh, and where I had been complicit um, throughout my life. Um, and I got to see, get a glimpse of all the dynamics that I had been creating in my life. And um, it really <laughs> seemed to turn me upside down. And um, I'm so grateful for um, all of the support that swept in, in the form of Sarah and um, Chris, um, who's traveling with her. And um, she basically walked me, you know, took me by the hand um, over the last four weeks to get me here. And um, so... Uh, I trust I'm in the right place um, because of the glimpse of what I've seen in my mind um, and seem to experience um, where um, I can be co-opted I have a fear. Uh, it's, it's, it's like I'm, I'm feeling right now, like I don't know whether I'm coming or going, and um, I don't know how to <laughs> relate anymore <laughs> to people. And... Um, I'm afraid to go back. I'm afraid of sliding back into my old uh, way of being. I'm, I've also got a lot of fear about what, <laughs> um, and I know that's, that's ego because it's past and <laughs> fear of the past and future, um, I, but I'm just expressing that I have a fear of now what things are going to look like, and the, and I, I know this this is on the surface. Um, my, the biggest fear that keeps coming up to distract me, um, so I'm just expressing that here, is that um, the fear of sacrifice, of um, loss, abandonment, um, of my special relationships, especially with my daughters and um, Sarah and I talked about handing over the des we, I've handed over the desires and and asking the Holy Spirit to repurpose um, everything the desires the relationships um, and um, so I guess I'm expressing that here, but also moment to moment. I guess my question is, moment to moment, um, as the, the fears keep coming up, what do I do with those? Is it just moment to moment, um, noticing the thoughts and um, recognizing that those desires are still in operation? And choosing the peace of God in that moment, do I just kind of ignore them, um, say no to them, and then carry on? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm still sort of allowing some distraction. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you for exposing that and sharing that. 
I remember these kind of questions and this uh, feeling like I was kind of not coming or going, like I was kind of some kind of a big in-between in the healing and the transformation, very disorienting, very uh, confusing. And when I've met people along the journey that have come to me and, and shared what you shared, what consistently comes out is this is that expansion of that faith I was talking about last night, where we really say to the Spirit, you know, I'm, I'm really giving this to you to lead and guide me. I'm not going to try to to even figure this out, these, these shifting emotions, and I'm not going to try to play the psychologist and, and personally try to think that I know the way or I can find the way. But this is where you put it, really put it on the Holy Spirit and Jesus and say, I give up. I mean, I, I am not going to be in the driver's seat. I am going to slide over to the passenger seat. <laughs> I'm going to invite you in to get behind the wheel. I think that's the song, Jesus Take the Wheel. Uh, a country song in the United States. I'm really going to 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 move over from from that position of trying to manage and control. It's that self personal responsibility thing that's so deeply, deeply ingrained. And like for example with your daughters and the special relationships, uh, those were some of my biggest concerns at the beginning when I just began traveling and I would have thoughts of my family, my grandmother, all these different <coughs> ones that would come to mind and Jesus would say, that's why I'm showing you, I'm going to show you the miracles, I'm going to bring in all types of holy encounters, we're going to fill up the painting, we're not, it's not a taking away. Uh, the ego always portrays the losing of special relationships as a major loss and huge grief. And Jesus would say, I'm not going to take your grandmother away and take your family away. I'm going to fill in the picture with so many beloveds. I'm just going to light the light your picture up so much. I want you to fall in love with everyone, including them, the ones that you're afraid to lose. I, I want this to be an expansive thing, so it's not a takeaway. It's a, it's like, let me open my heart to experience the, the love. And I had that happen even with, with people that would travel with me, they would have those fears of loss and abandonment. And then as we would go around and share the miracles and share the joy at talks and gatherings, the very ones that they were afraid to lose would come in different forms. Sometimes as children, as dogs, as cats, as parrots. You know, they, they they were very aware that they were being loved, but the form had shifted a little bit, just allowing them to start to feel, to let the love in. Because the belief is that love is limited, and somehow that we can lose the ones that we love. That's got to be the most heartbreaking ego belief, the belief that you could lose the ones that you love. Whereas when we start to open up to this calling, this function, this expansion in, in perception and, and in awareness, it's more like we can be shown that we had it all wired too small, that we, we really didn't understand what love was. You know, it's very humbling when it starts to just come more and more to us into awareness and we think, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? <laughs> How could I possibly have believed this? But we need experiences. And when you were talking at the beginning, it reminds me of that part in the Course where Jesus is saying that prisoners who have long been held in chains and long been held in darkness do not simply rise up once the light appears. It's just too big of a contrast. It's almost like being in a movie theater for two hours and watching a movie and going out the emergency exit on a brilliantly sunny day and going, 
oh, it hurts my eyes. Because the eyes have been so accustomed to the darkness that the, the blazing light is just too overwhelming. It's just too much. And so most are given a gradual opening, a gradual curriculum in coming to the light and coming to forgiveness so that it, it's, it, it can be accepted. Something that's too much, too overwhelming, you know, must, must hold off until, until the readiness is there, until the welcome is there. So those weeks with Sarah, just for you to, to allow yourself, that was almost like you giving yourself permission to face some things that were very hidden, that were very pushed out of awareness. And then coming here and giving yourself a whole week among all these beloveds, and just staying with the prayer of, orchestrate my week, Who, whoever I'm to meet that, can, that I can offer a blessing to, that can bless me, orchestrate that. Wherever I'm to sit for breakfast or lunch or dinner, you lead the way. You throw it on Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You say, I cannot handle this but you are here and it's yours. <laughs> if you want to do something with that responsibility, throw it at Jesus. <laughs> throw it at the Holy Spirit and say, sorry to be a bother, but uh, I'm going to unburden myself <laughs> and give you a direct upload <laughs> of all my worries and concerns. Because that's actually what Jesus and the Holy Spirit want. Bring me your burdens, bring me your worries, bring me your concerns, bring me your fears. You've just discovered some major fears that you were, bring them to me. Lay them at my feet. Unburden yourself. You know, you can think of this as like a playful week to come and you're going to be splish splashing around among your beloveds and opening your heart just to receive all the nurturing that you really are calling for and that, that you are so worthy of. You know, this, the, it's been heavy to carry this and now it's, the journey gets lighter as you open up and do what you're doing right now. You've just come up to, and you've just kind of shared it, which is a, a declaration of, of I am in a, an in-between state here I feel fragile. I feel uh, like I don't even know how to relate to people. So that's your prayer you're offering up. Be kind with me. Please be sweet with me. I'm very fragile. <laughs> and everybody is feeling that too. We know how that feels. And we love to offer the place of loving, accepting presence when somebody is, is in a, a fragile turn, making a fragile turn. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm going for it, and so I'm opening up to the playfulness, the fun, the the joy to have that flood in. And you mentioned the splish splash when I got on the the plane, um, the first plane to get here. I opened up the in-flight magazine, and there was a picture of a joyful little girl. Um, having come down a water slide with her arms up and smiling. And I thought, yes, <laughs> that's, that's me. That's what I want. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Thank you. Well, you're in for it. I, I can just, I'm not going <laughs> to say the movie, but tonight we're all going for a major heart-opening <laughs> movie. We're going to go in it together and boom! <laughs> <laughs> so, Yeah. Great stuff is coming. Thank you. Hello, David. Thank Hello. you very much. Hello. I am. I feel my question has been answered already, <laughs> and the reason for me to be sitting here is also done. But um, I will take the opportunity. I also, when I, well, I was on my flight th from the window, um, rainbows are very important to me, mm -hmm. and I saw for two minutes a uh, round shape light with the colors of the rainbow <laughs> right in front, in the cloud in front of me, and um, I, know, I knew it was something 
special. Mm -hmm. And many other things in this last couple of days have passed as well. But um, I, this morning I could feel my mind so at peace and so focused. And I was wondering in my meditation, how am I going to go back on Monday, next Monday to work? Because it feels so much more active and the life. And I was sitting at breakfast or so, I guess, with another angel, and she gave me the answer. She said, just hand it, it to, hand it to Christ. Why do you have to do it? And I said, of course. Again, I, I forgot. Um, but my question is about what you mentioned, that we have to put for number one, um, the Course of Miracles. Um, really, how far do you, I mean, what in practical terms do you mean with that? Because I think I've seen on YouTube you mentioning that it's just not possible to have like this spiritual life and because I would love to have like a partner and I, I, I have a job at the moment. So, so, and I know I've been a nun in past lives and I'm very connected to Jesus very much. So that's in a way easy to me. But so this, but what do you mean that it's not possible to have both sides. I mean, do you do we have to go? Or I guess the answer is different for everybody. But do you mean how much do I have to renounce? I mean, that's the question. So. Yeah, well, I think once you start to realize that that how powerful the mind is and how the world and all of its grievances and judgments and attachments has come from the ego. And you start to realize, wow, I, I want that raised up into awareness so I can let go of that, of, of feeding that, of investing in that. But you have a dream there and the dream symbols will be used by the spirit to unwind you from the sense of, of heaviness, of obligation, of duty, of guilt. You know, the, the spirit will use the dream symbols and it's not going to come and rip the dream away. It's going to come and, and say, here, this is for you. This is the next step. You know, it's not saying like in, the, in terms of renunciation, uh, Jesus does mention that the word renounce. He mentions that in the workbook where he says many have tried to renounce the world while still believing in it. So we could say with many convents and monasteries, people, you know, go in to be the bride of Christ and maybe at 12 or 14 or 16, sometimes very young, they lose their whole adolescence as they go in to follow these rules, these rituals, to take these vows, to marry Jesus, and so on and so forth. But in the mind, as long as the belief system is still there, as long as there still are things that are still wanted and desired but are just suppressed and pushed out of awareness, they're still there. You know, the guilt remains. And so what you're really doing is you're, you're handing over the world which was made by the ego as a distractive device and as a way to get lost. And you're saying, it's time to be repurposed. You know, I, I am going to have some fun with this repurposing. I am going to allow Jesus and Holy Spirit to use what I still believe in as part of the unwinding. So for me, in, in, like instead of learning yoga, learning Tai Chi, learning uh, different kinds of, of movement exercises or so forth. I, I enjoyed sports. So, yeah, instead of Tai Chi, it was golf. <laughs> instead of, uh, of other things, it was uh, basketball, uh, baseball. I mean, I, the spirit used the things that were still part of the ego belief system, the things that I still was drawn to in this world and instead of trying to send me off to renounce renounce all of this and now I want you to do that it was more like here I'll show you to to perceive 
the golf in a new way, as a mind training device. Just like yoga, it can be used as a body identification and a, an idol, or it can be used as a way of training the mind to come back, you know, into alignment. So, that undercuts this whole ego belief in relinquishment. Even lessons, workbook lessons 128 and 129, 128 is the world I see holds nothing that I want. Sounds very much like a, a re relinquishment lesson, but it's followed up with 129, beyond this world is a world I want. So there's the negation followed by, and this is something that's even better than the world that you perceive. To reach that, the, the Spirit and Jesus are so wise that they can use aspects of the ego belief system that you're drawn to, like the rainbows and the colors of the rainbow, and like Pocahontas learn, teach you to paint with all the colors of the wind. You know, it will, it will take what you are drawn to and it will use it in a way where you just, in the end, end up with a big smile on your face. Instead of a woe is me kind of a relinquishment uh, pathway, it's you are used in more and more ways that open your heart until you just end up with a big smile on your face and, and you go, what a ride! Like, wow, I didn't even anticipate that. So that's the blessing that that is for you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I think the only purpose for me was to sit here because <laughs> the previous ones <laughs> asked uh, the most questions. I had a question. Um, I really want to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Course of Miracles means to me. And that's also the core of my religious belief I had yes. before. So it combines. But uh, I thought it will not be like you or Francis or Kirsten that I have to leave my home and my husband and my children yeah. and my grandchildren. So, but what you said just a moment, you expand your love. So that's my answer now. I take that with me. But I have another question. I, um, I really feel I just have to live the joy. That that's my purpose in life. Nothing more, just joy. And every time I am choosing that, I stopped my job a few months ago. Something happens. <laughs> One of my, the eldest daughter is getting a divorce, so she is coming in my home with our granddaughter, which I love. But then I think, this is strange. Every time I think, now I'm going to enjoy walking, painting, uh, doing what I like, something happens. And um, at the core, I think I'm, I'm afraid to be very e egoistic when I'm just having, uh, when I'm just joyful. And um, yes, I want to share that. Yeah, as well. yeah I think, I think that's a very high and actually it's helpful and it's a noble pursuit. Uh, it reminds me of um, Joseph Campbell's Follow Your Bliss. Very much follow your joy. And there is a part in the Course where Jesus says that, that your mind is, is so deluded and so confused and so upside down. Um, that you cannot tell the difference between pain and joy, he says. And, and to me that's striking, you know, it's, it, it is an affront to the, to the mask. Like, well, maybe you say that, but, you know, I'm not that bad off. I can tell the difference between pain and joy. Because that would certainly be important if, if you're going to dedicate your life to following joy, and you can't tell the difference between pain and joy, then that would be something to explore. That would fit right in with your path. Like, well, yeah, that's important. I, need, I do need to be discerning to know the difference if I'm going to pursue one and I'm going to be guided by the joy and drawn by it. The good part of it is, is, is that in The Course in Miracles, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit needs happy learners. And that is in perfect alignment with your, your pathway of joy. 
The Holy Spirit needs happy learners. In other words, if I've learned the ego belief system, and not only learned it, but I've overlearned a tragic belief system that I've actually, we'll say not for just a few years, maybe for millennium, I've overlearned a very dark uh, belief system. It's no wonder the Holy Spirit needs happy learners because it must be if heaven is perfect happiness, if God's will for me is perfect happiness, that even as I approach heaven, it's going to be pretty joyful and happy. Maybe it's not perfect happiness, but it's going to get happier and happier and happier. And you don't reach heaven through death. And you don't reach heaven through pain. And you don't reach heaven through being uncomfortable. You, you reach heaven by going through the happy dream. And, and then we have to look at that. Okay, that sounds good too. Intuitively, that sounds right. That I wouldn't go from nightmares to absolute bliss. That there must be a stage that I go through from nightmares to pure joy. And that joy is the happy dream. And the happy dream is simply a dream of non-judgment, which I was talking about earlier. Not that you've stopped judging, but you just followed your experiences to the point that you opened your heart up so much that you finally found yourself in a state of mind that couldn't judge. Not that it even had stopped. Because <laughs> that's not even there. It's, it's just that it's, it's seen as attack is impossible. Judgment is impossible. That's the state. And that does take the guidance of the Holy Spirit to take us into that. Where we have to pray with every seeming situation, even the situation with your your daughter or granddaughter in the house and there's things that you enjoy and everything, but it, it just means that the, you're really praying for that prayer of the heart. Let me, let me be led into the joy. Let me experience the full gratitude and the appreciation. And you also know that if, if your daughter, your granddaughter, what's happening inside your house seems to rub you the wrong way, that something is getting exposed. And you know that. And that helps too, to know that, that there's a purpose for this. It's not just, wow, I'm unlucky <laughs> because this one happened. You know, there's a purpose to it. So that's what I like about that prayer at the beginning of A Course in Miracles. I am here only to be truly helpful. The truly part is really where the fine tuning comes in. Because most of us have some feeling of when we're being helpful. You know, we know how it feels to be helpful. But the truly helpful seems to raise it up into, okay, here's my prayer, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, decide for God for me. I give you my decision-making capacity to use for the benefit of me and the whole universe. Because you know the way. You are the one that is the mediator between the world of dreams and between heaven. So obviously you're the one that, that knows the entry point into the happy dream. And from your belief system, you know, that I hear that you, you hear that and you, you relate to that and you acknowledge that. So enjoy the adventure. I will. <laughs> okay. Very good. Well, we have almost stretched and used our entire time frame here, so uh, we will conclude this session right now. I believe there will be a song coming here, and there it comes. <laughs> and uh, have a wonderful afternoon, a wonderful lunch, and then tonight, yeah, we're going to take a nice dive down the rabbit hole together, but it, it's a rabbit hole of inspiration of heart-opening joy. So I think we're going to love that adventure. So I'll see you a little bit later. Thank you. Yes. So we've been sitting for a long time. So I would like to invite you first, before I sing, to just stand up for a moment. Yeah? And just let's just shake it out. <laughs> like you're on a cold shower. <laughs> Oh, I just want to 
one side. <sighs> Good. <laughs> Good. So uh, Kirsten and me both felt for me to sing, The Light Has Come. <laughs> And uh, some of you might know this, so always feel free to sing along. And I just really want to remind you um, that during these voice liberation things or singing along, you know, some people, they're really into it and you see their hearts open. And maybe others, you look at yourself and you're like, I can't do this or I can't sing this or these words, they bring up so much resistance. And then you see somebody else all in tears and seeming surrender. You're like, am I doing something wrong? So really, again, don't judge the process and use anything that comes up. So if you feel resistance towards the words or this morning when we're singing, you know, I'm an innocent child of God. and if I can't sing that. You know, I'm not an innocent child of God. That is exactly what needs to come up. So, you know, sing that and <laughs> sing, your, sing your fear, sing your resistance. Yeah, be, tr be truthful and be honest to yourself and know that it's, everything is helpful. Yeah. <laughs>
the light has come I have forgiven the world the light has come the light has come I have forgiven Thank you.